Good morning and welcome to everyone here in our fellowship hall, out in the parking lot, uh, online, or even listen via podcast. We are thankful to have you join us here for worship at Shiloh Reformed Church here in Faith. I am Pastor Richard Myers, and we are so blessed to have you as a part of this time with us right now. Did want to highlight some announcements as we get started. It's a busy time of the year. And you'll notice uh, as you look, we've got our annual congregational meeting today uh, to elect elders and deacons as well as approve the 2021 budget. Uh, so you see the names there. And there's also information sheets available over at the table. If you would like a copy of the budget uh, as the service concludes today, a copy of that is over there as well. Uh, Operation Christmas Child continues through next Sunday, you'll notice. Uh, we've got several boxes collected there, but it's not too late to grab one of the empty ones and bring it back uh, for us next week. Also, we are nearing our goal for 100 meals uh, for feeding of the 5,000. We're probably around 90 right now, uh, enough for 90. Uh, so if you can uh, help out with donations for hams or help out toward the other food items, the 38-ounce Hanover uh, green beans, the 40-ounce Bruce's yams, the 14-ounce Craft Deluxe Mac and Cheese, and that that would be a great help. We'll be getting that together later this week for this upcoming uh, weekend there. Uh, if you would make sure, though, if you're planning on delivering your items this week, please try to get them here by Wednesday. So that way we know what we need to do if, in case there's any items we need to get to make sure we have enough when we pack on Friday. Uh, also, you'll notice there is an informational and feedback meeting for parents of children fifth grade and under uh, coming up on Wednesday evening, November 8, 18th at 6.45. Don and, jo uh, Don and John will meet with parents and kind of let you know what's going on uh, in the ministry there and get any feedback that anyone has uh, that might be of some good encouragement or use there. So please make note of that meeting parents and the kids will have their usual activities going on during that time. Uh, women's circles are doing their barbecue dinner. You'll notice the deadline to get tickets is um, November 15th. So next Sunday, you must have a ticket to get a meal. So please make note in the bulletin there, it's a good meal, port pit uh, chicken, barbecue chicken, baked beans, slaw, roll, and dessert, $10 a plate. And uh, that would be a great uh, support there. Again, we got many other things going on at this time, but for now, I invite you to quiet your hearts as we prepare to enter into worship together. You'll join me in standing as we open up in prayer. Lord God, we come and acknowledge that we are privileged to come into the presence together of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who reigns over the universe. And Father God, we are thankful that you are in control. So we seek to come today to refocus our hearts, to recharge our batteries, to remember who you are, and to receive what you would have to give to us here today. Help us, in turn, to give you our very lives as a living sacrifice. Starting with this hour, as we seek to 
love you with all our hearts, minds, strength, and soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time now, I invite you to join me as we pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the one Lord for whose kingdom it stands. One human family under God, uniting all people of different races, nations, creeds in service and love. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. At this time now, we would like to invite all our vets who are present to please stand so that we can honor you appropriately. Please stand. If you will remain standing for the moment, uh, Lynn is going to pass you a 
gift from the church that we'd like to give to you in appreciation for your service to our uh, country. And, and uh, in just a few moments, Tanya is going to pray for you. But we do want to mention to those who are unable to be here today, or if you are out in your car, we want to make sure that you get your gift, uh, even if you aren't in the room here today. So if you would like to call the church office during the week, uh, we would be glad to either put it in your church mailbox or leave it in the church office where somebody could come by and pick it up for you. Or if you need be, we could even bring it to you uh, if you would like it. But indeed, we are blessed by each of you for your sacrifice. Uh, your examples are inspirational. They are not forgotten, and they are not taken for granted. At this time, I would like to invite Tanya Yates to have a prayer for our vets. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to start out with Thanksgiving, thanking you for um, all the veterans um, of the United States, especially the ones here in our church family. Uh, they have been such a force for good, not only here in the United States, but even the world. The whole world owes uh, gratitude to them for the courage and the the way they fought evil in every um, war that they've been placed into, God. We just praise you for them, for their courage, for their selflessness, and uh, their loyalty. And they've carried these attributes into their families. The gentlemen in this room, Lord, their families have been pillars in this community. And it's, I feel like a big part because of of them and I, I just thank you for that and I want to pray for each of them here today God that you would be with them help them know how very much they're appreciated we still appreciate them they still many of them do are just servants serving you still oh Lord in in your kingdom and we see that and I pray that we would help them know and that they would feel how very much they're appreciated help them Lord that have hurts that we might not even be aware of yes there's physical hurts but some of them have experienced things that we just can't even begin to understand but Jesus does understand he's been there and that's one person that understands greatly our deepest hurts and we just lift lift those up to you and ask for healing Lord and inner peace and most of all Lord we know we pray that they would know you I feel like most of them that are here do, but only you truly know the heart, Father. And the ones that do, I pray that they would know you in a greater way, that you, how very much you love them, that you're the lover of their soul. And also, Father, in closing, I want to say, ask you to help them pass these qualities down, Lord, to their children, their grandchildren. Our world desperately needs it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. At this time, if everyone will please stand as we sing America the Beautiful.
You may be seated. If you'll join me now as we pray. Father God, we come to you today to remember, to remember your greatness, to remember your goodness, and to remember your grace. We have received so much from you, that that we do not deserve. We have not always received what we deserve. We're thankful that in light of our sin, you have poured out your grace and mercy and love. You are a God of great patience, kindness, and love. We as a nation have been greatly blessed by you. But we're reminded from your word that when nations began to take those blessings for granted, they are often taken away. Father God, we pray that we as your people will humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways and seek your face, knowing that as we do that, you will begin to heal our lives individually. You will begin to heal our homes. You will begin to heal our churches and our communities and our countries and world. Help us, Lord, as your people to not take for granted your grace and the freedoms that Jesus secured when he died on the cross. But also, Lord, help us not to lose sight of the coming day of his return when he will set up his righteous reign. We look forward to that day. But until then, you've given us a light to shine here at Shiloh. We pray, Lord, that we will faithfully raise your banner high in victory for we know that after that cross there was the empty grave. And you challenge us, as we've been talking about, to serve others, to help others, to appreciate others, to receive others, and then engage others with the gospel. Our our mission, regardless of where the church finds itself in history or geographically, the mission never changes. And your provision and your power, when we abide in you, still enables us to bear much fruit and to do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So Lord God, as we come to you, many of us in weakness today, others of us feeling pretty good, we acknowledge that we need you. And we want you to pour out your power upon us. But first, help us to pour out our hearts before you so that you can cleanse us, renew us, and rejuvenate us for your glory as we seek to share Christ with the world. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do a quick survey here this morning. How many of you value protection? Raise your hand. Protection is pretty much important to everyone, isn't it? Protection in so many different ways. Today during our service, and so many on Wednesday of this week, we'll take the time to honor our vets who fought to protect us and the freedoms that we enjoy. And we are thankful for those currently serving in the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and even the re- recently initiated Space Force. They exist to defend us and our freedoms here and abroad. But even so, they also come to our aid when help is needed. We are thankful to our sheriff and police departments and first responders who are there to protect us when we need it. Many of us also exercise our right to bear arms to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our property. To safeguard our computers, we install firewalls and purchase 
virus and malware protection. To keep our identities from being stolen, we purchase identity protection plans. We call lawyers to protect our rights, doctors to protect our health, financial advisors to protect our savings, and the orchid man to protect our houses. You know, many of us have installed security systems at our houses, and some of us may have even gotten a good old guard dog uh, to help watch over things. I'm reminded of the story of the thief who was breaking into a house one night looking for valuables, looking all around with his flashlight, and he went to put a, uh, a piece of electronics in his bag, and all of a sudden he heard, Jesus is watching you. He froze, turned off his flashlight as quickly as he could, and waited. And when he heard nothing for the next few seconds, he's like, oh, must have been my imagination. So he turned his flashlight back on, started looking again, and then he was reaching for the smart TV, getting ready to unplug it, and then he heard that same creepy voice piercing the darkness again. Jesus is watching you. At this point, he's like, I gotta, I gotta deal with this. So he starts shining his flashlight around, frantically looking around the room to figure out where that voice was coming from, and eventually there in the corner he spotted a parrot in his cage well he's kind of irritated that all this ruckus was caused by a stupid little bird and so he said huh, who you think you are what's your name the parrot went Rock, Moses and he said what kind of moron would name their bird Moses he said Rock, the same moron who would call his Rockweiler Jesus Rock. <laughs> <laughs> protection is important to us but I don't care what kind of earthly protections we have they are all limited and they are imperfect there are times when people we count on let us down and the things we lean on and trust in fail us there is only one who the scriptures say that we can count on for our ultimate protection all the time. And that is the almighty, one true God. And today's scripture is primarily found in Psalm 91. I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn there. If you have your phones, you can look it up on your phone. But Psalm 91, we're going to start by looking at verses 1 through 2. Where the psalmist writes, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The Hebrew word translated shelter here can refer to a secret hiding place and what's the only way that you can know where a secret hiding place is if the person who's hiding there tells you or someone who is in the know tells you its location otherwise you don't know where to hide from the opposing forces that seek to take us down to dwell in such a place means that we are invited and welcomed to the point that we can make ourselves at home there and find rest and protection under the shadow of the very throne of the Most High. And if someone is the Most High, who's above them? No one, because they're the Most High. Not the more high, not the somewhat high, but the Most High. That's how God is described there the Lord personally provides us refuge shelter and sanctuary God is also described as our fortress which referred to a heavily fortified stronghold that was often built into the side of the rugged terrain in the Judean wilderness we've been studying on Wednesday nights about one in particular named Masada, built by King Herod. And basically, if you look throughout the Judean wilderness, there's all these jagged mountains and all this. 
And he built this humongous fortress on this plateau where it is said that he had enough storehouses to hold food that could not only support him but also his troops for 10 years. It had such a heavily built wall and it was so high from the ground. I think on the third, it was 13 feet high on the east side and 300 feet high on the west side. So when some Jewish zealots and their families, a total people including men, women, and children of 960 people retreated there from the Roman forces, it took the Romans an army of 15,000 soldiers almost two years to penetrate those walls. So a fortress is a place of security and protection. And that is the image that the psalmist uses for God. Because God is an impenetrable fortress. No one or nothing, if he doesn't want them coming in, can break through. For he is all-powerful. And in him we can place our total and complete trust. Then we get to verse 3. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. The psalmist says God will rescue us from danger. Whether it involves pestilence and disease or those trying to ensnare us, in their traps. Verses 5 through 6 assure us that basically God is working around the clock day and night. And like a mother bird who gathers her chicks close to her and covers them with her wings to keep them warm when the world can be so callously cold. Or the mother bird keeping her young cool from the oppressive heat in the day. God covers us. Like a mother bird, he longs to cover and protect us through the storms and the rain and the hail and everything else that could fall upon us that we might encounter. Like the mother bird, his faithfulness, the scripture says, shields us from predators. Especially Satan, who's described in 1 Peter 5, 8 as one who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Have you ever felt devoured? Mother birds are usually filled with a fierce devotion and will battle to the very end to protect their young. Human mothers are often much like that as well. I was reminded, always when I read this passage, I think about my mom. Uh, you know, back in the day when I was younger, 10 years old or younger, I can't remember exactly how old, might have been eight, somewhere around there, we'd go to Kmart. And back in that day, I could wander off and you don't have to worry about it. Don't know so much about doing that today. But Kmart was every bit as big as the Walmart down in Inner Street. And so I would always want to, I didn't want to be bored looking at clothes. I'd go look in the toy section. So I'd be scouting out the Star Wars stuff and all this and everything else. And I was there on my own. And all of a sudden, these two guys are coming and they're walking by me and I hear a right by my ear. And I, I thought, this is not good. They didn't know that I knew it because he missed. And I heard them over there. They were like, hey, man, I missed. Oh, you know, this, that, and the other. And they were older than I was. And Mama Bird wouldn't have ran. So immediately, this is how I roll, y'all. You know, I was like, they don't know. I put on my acting job. And I'm like, I started walking over this way casually, away from them as they were walking past me. Then I made a quick cut to this aisle and then a quick cut to this aisle. Made another cut to this aisle, and then boom, I was down, and I was running. <laughs> I kept my head below a clothes rack level, you know, shelves level, and I literally, I went all around Kmart 
And those buzzards kept chasing me all the way around. They never stopped. So they were obviously trying to bully me a little bit. And, you know, I was looking for my mom the whole time. Eventually, I caught up to my mom. You know how all those, you have your bigger aisles that you walk through, not those little smaller aisles. And I was walking with her, and they hadn't figured out what had happened yet. And they're coming up behind me, and they're like, oh, that's Mamba Bird. And they made a left turn. I said, Mom, that's down back there. And i never forget how she turned around. And she said, you keep your hands off my son. <laughs> you know what those two bullies look like? <laughs> now, when I was walking next to Mom at that point, what do you think I was doing? I was smiling. That's right. Okay? That's a picture of God's love, I think, for us. Because I don't think we have any idea of how many times in our lives, whether it's been in the physical realm that we can see or in the spiritual realm that we don't see, that God has intervened when the enemy sought to hurt us. And he said, you keep your hands off my child. And what happens to Satan when God says that? <laughs> so that brings us to our first point. When bad things happen, God can take care of us. Bad is our acronym for our outline, B-A-D. First point, blanket protection is assured during trials. Blanket protection is assured during trials. Now let me be point, quick to point out here that there is a key component on our part to receiving and experiencing this divine protection. This protection is for those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. It is for those who stay close to Him and under His wings. But how many in this life have been enticed by temptation or just simply wandered away and ventured out from the shelter of the Most High or left behind the security of the Lord's wings? Thinking that they knew what was best for them. Thinking that they could always come back to Mama Bird or the Lord later. Or that they could have more fun and freedom away from him. And then when they get bitten, attacked, or even mortally wounded, they turn around and ask God, why? How could you allow this? think about it if I had never sought and found the protection of my mother in Kmart what do you think would have happened to me I don't care how big Kmart was those guys were older than me they knew a little bit more than me they would have eventually found me I don't know what they would have done I doubt they would have hurt me bad but they didn't have my best interest in mind and why should it have come to a surprise if I had not done so the good news, my friends, is that even when we have wandered away from God's protection of the good and great shepherd, he is willing to leave the other 99 sheep in order to bring us back home. Moving on to verse 9. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Now, let's take a step back for a second. We just took a casual glance at this uh, passage apart from the context of the rest of scripture we would think that God has given us a guarantee that he will never allow anything bad to ever happen to us doesn't it read that way I mean how many of y'all thought hey let's go pick up a cobra I'm gonna walk on that thing not many of us 
You see, and many have even questioned this whole issue. They have questioned or even left the faith when something bad happened to them. I'm not talking about little bad stuff. I'm talking about the major stuff. Years ago, I remember a friend of mine's father who had just lost his mother. And within a matter of days, somebody plowed into him and wrecked his car. And mostly out of the heartache, he said, how could a loving God allow all this at one time? Many of you in this room have been there or close to it. If you're like me, you read the words of the psalmist here and wonder, how could he make such guarantees when there is so much hunger and suffering in the world. Aren't there a lot of Christians that are hungry out there? Aren't there a lot of Christians that are hurting? How can he say such things when babies are still born with Down syndrome, spina bifida, and heart defects? How can he make these claims when so many people seem to get away with so much wrong in this world? It hurts others. Better yet, how can he make such assurances when so many have been martyred for following faithfully their Christian faith, both in the past and today? In what sense, then, does God shield us because sometimes bad things do happen to even the closest of the, us? Who follow him. Satan tried to trip Jesus up with this very temptation to a certain degree. You remember when he took him out into the wilderness? In Luke, it is the third temptation. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. And listen to what Satan quotes. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. It's the very words we just read. Satan read them and quoted them to Jesus. He says, go ahead, Jesus. <laughs> Jump. If you're really the son of God, go ahead and prove. Prove it by jumping. You know, your father, surely he's not going to let his own son get hurt because after all, he promised it in his word that you wouldn't be harmed. You see, Satan was trying to get Jesus to force the issue. To try and test God is how it's worded. And in verse 12, Jesus picked up on this because he knew he was basically trying to get Jesus to say okay God now prove it and Jesus answered the scripture says do not put the Lord your God to the test now we haven't been tempted to jump off any buildings but how many times have people challenged God to prove his protection by asking for specific things Lord Heal my loved one. Lord, you know how much I need this money? Give me this money right now. Or Lord, stop that person from lying about me. Or Lord, keep this person from hurting me anymore. And when God doesn't remove or prevent the pain and heartache from happening, we grow confused, discouraged sometimes even bitter because his protection can't immediately be felt or seen. You been there? You ever been trying to figure all that out? The psalmist says that God will save us from the fowler's snare, yet terrorists are still bombing and burning churches to the ground and places like Sri Lanka and Indonesia. 
The psalmist says God will protect us from pestilence and plague, yet some close to Christ have died during COVID-19. The psalmist says that we will observe with our own eyes the punishment of the wicked, and yet we continue to watch so many continue to get away with evil seemingly without any consequences. How do we make sense of this apparent inconsistency? Well, to help us understand this paradox, let's look at another one that Jesus uses, it seems, back in uh, Luke 21 when he's talking about the end times. Listen carefully to what he says in verse 16 through through 19. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Has anybody been betrayed that, to that point yet? Anybody in your family betrayed you to that point? Where we're put to death? He goes on to say, all men will hate you because of me. But get this next part. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. You're like me, you go, huh? Did you catch that? Jesus describes all these horrible, painful things that will happen to his followers, including betrayal from those closest to us and our own execution. Yet he still promises, not a head of your hair, a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. Is Jesus talking out of both sides of his mouth, do you think, here? Or is there a deeper perspective and truth that is being presented to us? Obviously, I think the latter applies here. I think a glimpse of that is also at the end of our psalm in verses 14 through 15. God says, he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Did you hear that? I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. The Lord says to the psalmist that he will be with those who love him in trouble. Not spare them all from trouble. Consider carefully the words of Paul in Romans 8, 28. We often quote them. And I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. It says... We know that those who love God, or those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Notice what Paul does not say. He does not say everything's good. Everything's good. No. Some things are horrible. Some things are evil. Some things are hurtful. But what he does say that all things work together. You can't see the whole picture in the jigsaw puzzle until all the pieces are together for good. That's our second point. We've heard it before, but we need this reminder today. All things work together for good during trials. Does that apply even when we can't see the good in the immediate moment? Absolutely. Faith is not a matter of feeling or circumstances. It's a matter of spiritual reality. All things work together for good during trials. Let me give you a couple of pictures to kind of illustrate this. I remember my dad talking about my brother when my brother was really, really little. Toddler type age, maybe three, I don't know, somewhere in there. And He decided one day it would be fun to throw a blanket over his head where he couldn't see anything and just, boom, take off running. Well, my dad obviously saw what? The danger in such of a thing. So he began to catch my brother. And guess what happened over time after he caught him a few times? It became a game to my brother. As a little side note, Do we sometimes treat sin like a game and expect God to continue bailing us out? Stepping back over here. 
So my dad, in his adult wisdom, figured, I need to do something about this because one day he may throw a blanket over his head and plow into something that could really hurt him. So a funny thing happened. My dad continued to watch him closely. But if my brother was going to plow right into a wall, guess what my dad let him do? Boom! He let him just run full blast, full steam ahead right into that wall. If my brother was running toward the corner of a sharp piece of furniture, my dad would still grab him. How do you think it felt when my brother, upon impact, into that wall? <laughs> Boom! We can only imagine. And after doing that a few times, guess what happened? He stopped doing it. And that was for his own good. The point of that story is sometimes pain serves a bigger purpose. Sometimes pain can be used to protect our ultimate well-being. Another story is familiar to all of us. It's found in Genesis 37 through 50. It's the story of Joseph. If you'll remember, Joseph was a cocky young kid, been favored by his father. He wound up being betrayed by his brothers who were jealous of him, who sold him into slavery. Once he became a slave, he was uh, falsely accused of trying to make moves on his master's wife. At that point, after those years of in slavery of faithful service, he then got demoted to prison and was locked up in a dungeon for several years. Eventually, he made a contact with one of the Pharaoh's officials, a couple of them there. And when that, one of those officials made his way back to Pharaoh, a few years later, after he had interpreted that official's dream in prison, Pharaoh had a dream that nobody can interpret. And guess who that official remembered? Daniel. So one day, unsuspectingly, they get, you do, you got to get cleaned up. You're going in the presence of the king. He goes and appears to the Pharaoh. He interprets the dream. And at that point, Pharaoh makes him second in command over the nation because he knows he is the right man to plan for the famine that is on the way. And then eventually, years, years and years later, much more than a decade, Joseph's brothers show up asking for food for the family. They didn't recognize Joseph. But eventually he revealed himself to them. You remember the story? And they were scared at first. Then things went fine. Then his father came. But when his father died, they were thinking, oh, no, now that our dad's dead, he's liable to kill us. And listen to what Joseph said. Listen to his perspective. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. Now, I'm intended to harm me? You turkey sold me into slavery. You know what happened after that? I was in that for years. And then I got falsely accused. Then I got locked up in prison. Then I got forgotten by the official for even more years. You see what you cost me? You see how you harmed me? No, no. He did not say that. He said, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done which was feeding many the saving of many lives he said now let me paraphrase what joseph is saying here hey guys what you did to me it was wrong it caused me a lot of heartache and pain over the years but god was with me and protected me in my troubles through my trials he used them to humble me and shape my character to prepare me for the leadership role that i am in today he used those trials to put me in the right places so that i could meet the right people so that those connections could get me to where i am at the right time in order to impact the world now that's an eternal perspective you see, not all things are good. They're not. And I'm not asking anybody to pretend that they're not. Some things are wrong and cause deep heartache and great pain. But even in those things, they can be used by God to accomplish His awesome, amazing will in us and in this world. At times, God does not heal us from pestilence. 
but sometimes he does. At times, God does not rescue us from the wrongs of others, but other times he chooses to do so. At times, God doesn't always punish the wicked through earthly means, but sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. But either way, regardless of the earthly outcome, we can trust that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Moving on to verse 15 and 16. God says, he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Did you catch that? Some of us will experience this deliverance, honor, and long life here on earth. But all of us who remain close to Christ and remain under his protective covering, all of us who do so will experience salvation, honor, and eternal life. Which brings us to our final point. Deliverance from trials is eternally guaranteed. Deliverance from trials is eternally guaranteed. Think about this in light of those familiar words in the Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6. Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor. There's still going to be poverty. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Upon Christ's return and his perfect reign when it is set up, everything will be made right in the new heaven and the new earth. And it's described in Revelation 21. You've heard me read these words of John before. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That is the hope. And deliverance that is assured to all who dwell under the protective, protective covering in the wings of our Lord. Let us pray. We confess sometimes, Father, that uh, we don't even realize how much you're protecting us. And we take it for granted. We also confess, Lord, that sometimes we don't like the way you protect us. Sometimes we don't like the way that you protect us through letting us experience pain. Help us to remember that all things work together for good to those who love you and dwell in your shelter. And Lord God, we pray for those who may not yet be under your wings. Lord, who have not ever considered their need for your son, Jesus Christ. And if anyone is listening online or is here in this place right now, Lord, I just want to show them how to pray for that shelter and that covering and that salvation that lasts throughout all eternity so that they can rest secured forever in your protection. So, Lord, if there's anyone here or out there, I pray that they can pray along with me. Father, I have sinned, and according to your word, they deserve death eternal. 
and separation from you. But I acknowledge Jesus as my Savior, as the one who died that death on the cross in my place. And in doing so, he was the mother bird who wrapped his forgiving wings around and covered my sin and was devoured on the cross so that I might live eternally. I invite your Holy Spirit into my heart to walk with me every day to continue to remind me to remain under your covering and to remind me of your covering as the trials in life ahead come my way. And in the blessings, help us not to forget just still how dependent upon your covering and protection we are. Lord God, I thank you. If anybody prayed that prayer in hearing this message, I am thankful that they have just responded to the great shepherd who came to pursue them, the one sheep, so that they might be able to join the rest of us, 99, who are already in the home. I pray, Lord, if they are in our area, they can find the church home perhaps here or in another Bible-believing church. Or if there's somewhere else, where else, lead them to the right place for them, for them to continue to grow. For we know an essential part of that protection and covering is dwelling in the house of the Lord where your people worship you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.